So in this next video in the playlist on measure theory, we're going to now move on and look at the definition of sigma algebras. So we've already been over semi-algebras and algebras, which are special subsets of the power set of a set that are based certain properties. We're now going to look at the third one, the most advanced one, which is sigma algebras. And this is an upgrade on the definition of an algebra. So just as algebra was an upgrade on semi-algebra, sigma algebra is an upgrade on algebra. So again, we've got some set X and our sigma algebra, which I'll denote capital sigma, is going to be a subset of the power set of X. And the properties that it's going to need to obey, I'm firstly going to write down the properties of an algebra because it does obey all of those and then we'll upgrade the second one and it will become then a sigma algebra. So one, the empty set and the whole set have to be within the sigma algebra. Two, um, firstly, let's write it down for an algebra. It was closed under finite intersections. So if E1 and E2 are elements of sigma, then E1 intersect E2 is an element of sigma. And then three, is that if E is an element of sigma, then E complement is also an element of sigma, so that the algebra is closed under complement and closed under finite intersection. So if our class of subsets of X obeys these properties, then it is called an algebra. Now, to be called a sigma algebra, it has to be upgraded this second property is the one that's going to be upgraded and it's going to be upgraded to it now has to be closed under not just finite intersections but countable intersections so i'm going to rub this out and rewrite it so we're going to have ei elements of sigma for i is a natural number then the intersection oh not that, sorry. The intersection from i is equal to 1 to now potentially infinity of ei. This has to be an element of sigma. So closed under countable intersections, not just finite. Countable, of course, could mean finite or it could be countably infinite. We're not insisting that it's closed under uncountable intersections or arbitrary intersections, just upgraded it to countable. Now, a word on this name, sigma algebra, you might wonder, well, why is it called sigma algebra? And you might say, well, we're denoting it sigma, there's a good enough reason. But you will see in measure theory, often when we say, when we stick sigma in front of something, this is kind of meaning that the thing has become countable. So we kind of use sigma to mean countable. So this is kind of an algebra that's been made more advanced and made countable. So you'll see later when we define set functions on semi-algebras and algebras and sigma algebras that there is an additivity property that is very important for set functions to have. And then when that additivity is moved beyond just finite additivity to countable additivity, Instead of calling it countable additivity, we call it sigma additivity. So the sigma again is kind of saying that something has been upgraded so that it now holds true for countable something. So that's kind of just uh, a word on this name sigma that you'll see it used a lot in measure theory. And it's kind of used to mean that some sort of property is now holding true for in the countable scenario rather than just in the finite scenario. And indeed that holds true here. This closure under intersection is now true not just for finite intersections but for countable intersections. So that is then the definition of a sigma algebra. The empty set and the whole set have to be in the sigma algebra, it has to be closed under countable intersections and it has to be closed under complement. And if you have such a class of subsets of x then we call that set of subsets a sigma algebra of x. And a little hints to where we're going, the pair of a set equipped with a sigma algebra over it, i.e. sigma algebra of subsets of it, this structure is called a measurable space.
is going to be very important in measure theory. Uh, so sigma algebra is very, very important. Important definition to get used to. At the moment, we're just getting used to the definition, but this is a hint as to uh, where this is going to go. We're going to equip this with further structure, and it will then turn into a measure space. But when you've just got the set with a sigma algebra, that pair is called a measurable space. And I'd like to just draw some parallels. So if you know topology, you'll know that a topological space is a set with a set of subsets uh, equipped on it as well, or defined on it as well. So this is called the topology. And again, this is a subset of the power set of X. And it defines what subsets of the space here are going to be the open sets in this structure. And I just like to compare and contrast the properties that a sigma algebra obeys to the properties that a topology obeys. So actually, if we go over the properties of topology, the first one is the same, that the empty set and the whole space have to be in the topology. The second one, and I'll try and do them in as reasonable order as possible, so we'll go for intersection next. The next one is that if you have a finite intersection of elements in the topology, so if you have E1 and E2 are in the topology, then E1 intersect E2 also has to be in the topology. So if you take two open sets, E1 and E2, intersecting them will also give you an open set, but only finite intersections. So topologies only have to be closed under finite intersections. And if we take the basic example of the real line and take the standard topology on there, you see why the definition of topological space needs to only be finite intersections. If you consider like all of the intervals from minus a to a where, um, in fact, we could just take, um, mm, uh, in fact, I'll change this a little bit. So we'll go minus 1 over a to 1 over a, where a is an element of the natural numbers, where the natural numbers means from 1 onwards, i.e. not including 0. So this will then be the intervals minus 1 to 1, then we'll have minus a half to a half, and then minus a third to a third, and it will go on and on. So you've got a countable number of these open intervals. Now let's say if we intersect all of these from a is equal to 1 to infinity, what do you get there? These are all open intervals, by the way, of course, so they're all open sets in the standard topology on the real line. But if you intersect them all together, there is going to be only one thing that survives, and that is zero. So this will give you the set that has just got zero inside it. Everything else, if you take any other number that's on either side, eventually you'll get to an interval that's too small to contain that, so it therefore won't be in the intersection of all of these things, whereas zero will be in absolutely every single one of these. As far as A goes, you know, you can take A as far as you like off to infinity, it will always still contain zero, so zero will be in every single one of them. So there is something in here, but only one thing, and that's zero. And this set, this singleton set just with zero in, this isn't an open set, so I've intersected a whole bunch of open intervals together to get something that's not open, so it can't be the case that um, open sets, that if you intersect a countable number of open sets that you still end up with an open set. So it is only closed under finite intersections that is required for topology. And here's the intuition as to why you don't want to strengthen it to uh, being uh, closed under countable intersections. So there's a contrast. And then three, the topologies are not closed under complements. You know, that should be reasonably obvious. If I take the complement of just the open interval from negative 1 to 1, then I'll get, you know, uh, it will be a union of minus infinity to negative 1 closed at negative 1 with 1 to plus infinity here. Uh, and this is not an open set, you know, these points at negative 1 and 1 are not interior points. So complements are not going to be open sets, so topology should not be closed under complements. In fact, the third property of a topological space is actually that you can 
union arbitrary numbers of open sets together and you will still end up with an open set. So it's closed under arbitrary union, not closed under finite union, not closed under countable union, closed under arbitrary union. You can have an uncountable union. And if they're all open sets, it will still be uh, an open set afterwards. So if we have E, I, which are all elements of the topology, where I is in some index set, which is possibly uncountable, then if you union E, I together, where I runs over this index set, this will still be an element of, topo of the topology. So closed under arbitrary union is the other property of a topological space. Oh, sorry, of a topology. The topological space, of course, is the set equipped with the topology. So these are the, these are the definition, defining properties of a topology. So um, different from the defining conditions of a sigma algebra. Uh, I thought it was nice just to compare to sort of, you know, because they are similar concepts, but capturing very different things. Um, just with regards to union, so we saw how in the case of an algebra that you can take property two and property three to conclude that the algebra is closed under finite union as well. If it's closed under finite intersection and closed under complement, then by De Morgan's laws, it's also closed under finite union. And indeed, you can do the same thing with sigma algebras. So we can take the fact that it's closed under countable intersection and closed under complement and conclude that it must be closed under countable union. So we get something similar then to this third property of a topology, but not as strong. Ours is only going to be countable unions, not uncountable unions, as was the case in topology. So let's just prove that. So put topology now to one side. That was just a sort of aside, really. Uh, and now let's get back to the actual thing we're studying, which is sigma algebra. So I want to show that property two and three imply that uh, it will be closed under countable unions. And indeed, just as with algebras, it went the other way, that we could replace property two, in fact, with closed under countable union. And then as long as we've got the complement here, that's utterly equivalent to being closed under countable intersections. So we, we could call this property four that is kind of interchangeable with property two, indeed, logically equivalent to property two. So it is interchangeable. Let's show this. So um, let's take E i that are all elements of sigma then, where um, i is an element of the natural numbers. And we're going to take this countable union, union from i is equal to 1 to infinity of E i. And we want to show that this is going to be an element of sigma. So again, the same sort of idea then, we're going to need the infinite version of De Morgan's laws. So because we know that all of the EIs are elements of sigma and we know that sigma is closed under complement, then we can complement them all. So we know EI complements are all elements of sigma. Then we know it's closed under countable intersection. So we can intersect all of these complements together. Intersect from I is equal to 1 to infinity of EI complement. This is now going to be an element of sigma. Um, and then we can take the complement of that, and that will still be in sigma because that sigma is closed under complement. And then the infinite version of De Morgan's law is that this is equal to this. Let me try and persuade you of that. So let's go both ways. So to show that these two things are equal to one another, all we need to do is show that this is a subset of this and that this is a subset of this. So... If we take x is an element of union from i is equal to 1 to infinity of e i, then that means that x has to be in one of these things that we're unioning together. So x is therefore an element of some e, and let's just call it k, where k is some natural number. We don't know what it is, but it's some fixed value that we could isolate. It has to be an element of one of them. Therefore, we know that x is not an element of ek complement and that means that x cannot be in this thing here so x is therefore not an element of the intersection of i is equal to 1 to infinity of ei complement because for this one which is going to be in here 
Uh, it's not an element of that, therefore it can't be in the intersection of all of them, because it, the intersection is everything that's in every single one of them, and it's not in this one. So it's not in that, and therefore it's in this thing's complement. So x is therefore an element of intersection i is equal to 1 to infinity of ei complement complement. So I've shown, therefore, that if you take an element that's in here, it's also in here. Therefore, this thing do a big symbol here, is a subset of this thing here. Now let's go the other way around. So if we start with x as an element of this thing, intersection i is equal to 1 to infinity of ei complement complement, we now want to show that that implies that x is also an element of this, which will then imply that this is a subset of this, and then because we know that both subsets of each other, we know they're equal to one another as sets. So if x is an element of this, then that means x is not an element of this thing. So x is therefore not an element. The intersection from i is equal to 1 to infinity of ei complement, which means that it must not be in at least one of these. If it's not in the intersection, if it was in all of them, then it would be in the intersection. So there must be at least one of these that it's not in. So let's call that one that we find that's not in. Again, we'll call it EK. So there's some EK where X is not in that thing's complement, but that then means that X is, of course, in EK. And as X is in EK, X is then going to be an element of the union from I is equal to 1 to infinity of EI because it's in one of the specific ones that's being unioned here. And hence we've done what we needed to do. We've uh, shown that if it's in there, it's then in there. So this is a subset of this, and then we can conclude that these two are equal to one another. So that's De Morgan's law, the infinite version of De Morgan's law. So indeed, this thing here is equal to this thing here, and I've just shown you that this thing here is an element of sigma. If all of the EIs are elements of sigma, therefore this is an element of sigma. So it is true that it's closed under countable union. So if it's closed under countable intersection and it's closed under complement, you can then conclude that it's closed under countable union. And I suppose just for completeness, we could do the other way around, so we could show the equivalence of these two. So we could show that if we replace two with that it's closed under countable union, and then if we have that it's closed under complement, we could then show that it's uh, closed under countable intersection. Let's just do that just for uh, practice. So we've now got that four and three are true, and we want to show that that implies two is true. So it's, it's again basically just exactly the same thing. So we'll take EI are elements of sigma, so we've got a countable number of elements of the sigma algebra, and we now want to show that, that the intersection of all of these, so countable intersection from i is equal to 1 to infinity of ei, we want to show that that's going to be an element of sigma. So again, we know that ei complements are all elements of sigma. We then know, because 4 is true, that the union from i is equal to 1 to infinity of ei complement is an element of sigma, and we therefore also know that its complement is an element of sigma. And then it's going to be the other form, infinite form of de Morgan's law, that this union complement is equal to this intersection. And again, we can just say why that's going to be. So Let's show that if you're in this, you're in this, and that if you're in this, you're in this, to show that they're equivalent. So if you're in this, that means that you are in every single one of these, which means that you're in none of their complements. So it means that you're not going to be in any of these things, and therefore you're not going to be in the union of all of these things. So you're not in this, and therefore you are in the complement of this. So if you're in that, you're going to be in that. Now let's go the other way around. So if you're in this, so that means that you're in the complement of this thing, which means you're not in this thing. So x is not going to be inside this, which means that it can't be in any of the things that are being unioned here. So it's not in any of these complements, and therefore it must be in all of these original things, in all the EIs, if it's not in any of the EI complements. Therefore, 
when you intersect all of the EIs, it will be in that intersection. So if you're in this, you're going to be in this. So that would be the argument. I haven't written it all out, but again, it would be a same, the same argument of showing that this is a subset of this and this is a subset of this by taking an arbitrary element of each one and showing it's in the other one. So that's how you argue these infinite forms of De Morgan's laws. Um, so yes, what we've overall shown then is that if you had 4 and 3, then you could uh, get to 2. So indeed, 4 and 2 are equivalent. You could replace 2 with 4 here. I'm not going to. I'm going to keep the intersection form, but we need to also be aware that it, with the complement, implies the closed under countable union form. So that's all I wanted to say really about sigma algebras. I suppose I should just talk about examples. So we're not going to actually go through an interesting example in this video because it's quite complicated. Sigma algebras are quite complicated to actually construct one. We'll do it, obviously. They're going to be central to measure theory, uh, but we need more. Um, but I can tell you that there will always be an example. So if you take any set x, you can always take the whole power set. If you take that as your class of subsets of x, then that's always going to obey all of these three properties. Of course, these are going to be in there because it's every subset, so they're going to be there. And of course, if you take any countable number of elements of the power set and intersect them together, you're always going to end up with another subset that's going to have to be back in the power set. So of course, it's going to be closed into countable intersection. And of course, again, it's going to be closed into complement because the complement is still a subset of the overall set, so it's therefore going to be in the power set. So the power set is always an example of a sigma algebra, no matter what um, set you start off with. Uh, not a very interesting example, but one nonetheless. Also, I suppose I could say, we in the video on semi-algebras and algebras, we did that example with a finite set, so I think, if I remember rightly, we had our set. It was something like a to zeta, I think. Um, so a finite set of three things, and then we had this algebra, which was the empty set, the whole set, and then all the singleton sets, so the set with a in it, the set with two in it, and the set with zeta in it. So this was an algebra. This would also satisfy the properties of a sigma algebra, because if you've got a finite set, so we could have denoted this sigma if you wanted, um, and this actually demonstrates how this concept of upgrading from an algebra to a sigma algebra, it's not interesting at all if your original set is a finite set. It becomes interesting in the infinite case. Uh, of course it does, because all we've upgraded is going from finite intersections to countable intersections. That's not going to be interesting if you're working with a finite set. Uh, the reason being that, you know, if you, this is, this does satisfy the axioms of a sigma algebra because it was closed under finite intersections. All we're now insisting is that it has to be closed under countable intersections. But, you know, if you think about trying to take a countable intersection of things from this algebra here, there's only five things in it. So how, even if you come up with a countable sequence of them, you're going to have to have repetitions. You're going to have to be using the same thing over and over again because there's only five things to pick from. So your intersection, your countable intersection is always going to reduce down to just a finite intersection and we've already shown that this is closed under finite intersections. So it is therefore closed under countable intersections because there's only finite number of things in it that you can intersect together. So this is only going to become interesting in the case where you've got an infinite set and therefore you can actually build infinite sets of subsets. So in the finite case, any algebra that you construct is always trivially going to also qualify to be called a sigma algebra. So there's, there's another example if you like. This is a sigma algebra of this set x. Uh, a trivial example though. As I say, we will come to more complicated examples, but I'm afraid it is much more complicated when you come to the actual interesting examples. Uh, so for now, we're just getting used to the definition. So thank you for watching.